Hi, my name is Martin Murphy. Here at Ringin College of Art and Design, my job is to train artists how to create the most visually sophisticated graphics for games. But before we even talk about how amazingly cool a game should look, we first need an idea. And tonight, I'm going to be your coach to help you make a game. Hi folks, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about gaming. I'm going to share some views tonight that I hold dear about game design. And I hope you're going to remember these points because, um, like I said in the video, you're going to make a game tonight. Um, in the back of the room, we have 14 of our uh, dedicated students from Ringling College of Art and Design from the Game Design Club. And in about 10 minutes, you're going to join them and make a game, OK? So let me tell you something. This is not their first rodeo, all right? <laughs> so uh, they're going to help you along. But you're going to need to suit up and get ready, because you're going to make a game. Before we break up into groups, I'm going to go over some lessons that I've learned over my 20 years of working in games by offering you a third view on a well-known phrase from our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Amongst those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So let's get going. We're going to use this as our guide. We'll start off with, we hold these truths to be self-evident. These are the things we know to be true without proof. And some of the truths I hold dear about games stem from my time in the arcade industry, where we slugged it out for spare change. While other truths are ones in which I've recently attached to with the advent of mobile and social games, where we slug it out for spare moments. I see these truths as guidelines and would be willing to revisit any of them, depending on the goals of the game and the results of playtesting. Playtesting usually comes at the end of the game, but I want you folks to think about it from the get-go, OK? You may have the best ideas in the world, but as soon as you release your product out into the wild, oh, man, it can all come crashing down as soon as those users put their hands on it, OK? So from the very beginning of the process, no matter what type of game you're making, I want you to be prepared and plan to do testing, OK? Test with your friends and family. Test with those people who hate games and even with those people who love games. When in doubt, test it, OK? Only through careful observation of people trying to play your game can you hope to develop the level of empathy for the player that you need to be successful. You need to develop the same level of empathy that that Caesar the Dog Whisperer guys has for dogs. <laughs> All right? You need to see what the player sees, do what the player does, and hear what they're thinking. As a father of five, one of the complaints I all, most often hear is things are not fair, right? <laughs> so um, let me go back here. You're like, so, well, all men are created equal. Well, you know, nobody likes to get hosed. So one of the things I remind my kids is one of my favorite Scoutmaster sayings. It says, a son, fair is not an adult word. <laughs> and creating games, uh, a, a fair and balanced play experience, um, at least the perception of it, is an important goal. But equally important, you shouldn't baby the player either. Fairness should be relative. The player should see an opportunity to develop mastery, like they can get there, but they shouldn't feel like a superhero from the start, OK? To me, one of the greatest appeals of games is the opportunity to develop mastery. Maybe something that's uh, impossible to do in real life, maybe something I have never done. What you're looking to do is take a player from beginner to expert. This is what we call a player arc, taking a person from the apprentice to master. In uh, game terms, taking the person from noob to pro. 
So how do you do this? As a game designer, if you can measure it, you can make it a game. So what I would suggest to you is look for opportunities where you can create a web of nuances, an ecology of factors in which a player has to develop some mastery behind in order to get an edge over the game itself or another player, okay? But we never want to make these games too intense or too daunting for a new player. The gold standard for games is a game that's easy to learn and is difficult to master. All right, so here's the next line. They are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. As a creator of a game, you define the play field, the pieces, and how they move. That sounds pretty almighty. But don't get carried away with your newfound powers. For the most part, games are subservient or a slave to the technology, all right? As a game, that's not a bad thing. As a game creator, I'm gonna encourage you to look for those opportunities to leverage the medium of your system, your game, whatever you're using, and look for ways to uniquely take advantage of that tech. Look for experiences in which they could have on that one system that they couldn't have on another. In the arcade days, we looked to create an experience that folks couldn't get at home, an exclusive experience. But the console industry caught up to us, right? They zoomed right past, Woo. This is much like what the movie industry is facing now with you know, the, the rise of home theaters and you know, personal theaters that people have. So, from the game industry perspective, I believe we've learned this lesson. If I look at all the products that are being created out there, they're taking advantage of what's unique about each platform, okay? They're using each tech a little bit better. Here's an example. So back early 90s, um, Myst came out. It was a lush point-and-click exploration game, and it came out at the advent of the CD-ROM. This product was OEM'd with new computers selling CD-ROMs like hotcakes. The next product I wanted to talk about was Doom. This is the game in which was, I've been told that it was installed in more PC computers than DOS. I mean, than uh, Windows, sorry. <laughs> at this point, uh, Doom uh, was the game that helped popularize multiplayer games. And then you all know about um, Wii Bowling, where, where that use that motion sensing device, and how, how that just fit perfectly, and how it got such a large audience to follow it. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced just the you know, the simple pleasure of flicking a bird at a contract and blowing it up. <laughs> so as you're designing your game, think about like, okay, how, how does it take advantage of this little medium and this little tech the best way possible? So the next one is that among these are life. To me, one of the most attractive aspects of games is the extra life. It's the do-over, right? Unfortunately, in real life, this is, not, uh, this is not as common. But if you folks had the power of undo, we would use it a lot more often. We would take more chances. <laughs> the reason why we take chances is to achieve a reward that we couldn't get without acting. A reward that causes us to act in the heat of the moment. A reward that we plot and scheme for in our quieter moments. Okay. As game designers, because that's what you're going to be in a couple of minutes, as game designers, I want you to think about short-term and long-term goals for your players, okay? I want you to create situations where that player is focused, <clears throat> focused on the heat of the moment and having to decide between playing it safe or passing that, that Hail Mary pass, throwing it all the way out there. And I want you to think about situations where, you know, maybe you can get the player to think about how they're going to improve their strategy or their tactics even outside of an active game session. We want to enable those schemers. All right, next one's liberty. Liberty is the freedom to control our actions. Um, in games, this is often associated with agency. In Jane Murray's book, Hamlet on the Holodeck, she described agency as a satisfying power to uh, 
meaningfully, uh, take meaningful action and see the results of our decisions and choices, this is the feedback part of it. In real life, liberty doesn't mean we can do whatever we want. We're constrained by the laws of nature, of society, but life is full of choices. In games, these constraints take form of the rules, the limitations of the system, and the game mechanics. Game mechanics are most associated with what a player can do and how they do it in the game. What I call, and other people call in the industry, the verbs. You're giving a player a tool, a function, a special ability that they can use inside of that custom-made environment that you've given them. A player can't do whatever they want, or that's going to be expensive. Um, <clears throat> but you sh as a game designer, you should afford them as many opportunities as possible that they can use that newfound power. And you should try to avoid situations where the player feels limited or out of control. Great game designers provide their players with many opportunities to solve their problems, to face the opposition, to conquer their challenges that they're facing in the game. And they give them that custom-fitted sandbox that they can play in. All right, so this is the one in which I lose people. One over there. <laughs> All right, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so I feel our success and our survival as a species has been more determined by our aversion from unhappiness and fear than it has been by our pursuit of happiness. Happiness is fleeting, but it, it sure beats the alternative. Okay, games offer us a chance to have control of our lives in ways in which may be out of our control in the real world. They also offer us a chance to have that thrill of the chase. They offer us an opportunity to control our environment, to be someone or something that we can't be in the real world. Our real world might be a real mess, but on my virtual farm, no darn varmint better step foot on it, <laughs> or it's going to get a thumping. Your goal as a game designer is to make a game in which the player's disappointed when it's over. In closing, creating games is an iterative art. It's a process of problem solving, questioning your own thinking, and then testing and then retesting your refinements. Games are being developed all over the world and here in Florida. I hope through tonight's experience that um, I can help you put Sarasota on the map. Thank you.